Thank you, Len, uh, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you to all who've come here. Uh, I've really had a blast this week. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, it's always um, a pleasure to see and, and work with many uh, outstanding colleagues at JGI and many of the users here. And what's really unique about a meeting like this is that it's such a forum for bringing normally diverse communities together. And so I've really found that very useful to have discussions with many of you throughout the week. And um, we've, you know, we've been talking a lot about applications of genomics across a wide range of areas, across our world, across many areas of both the land. We've taken to the sea and we've taken uh, to the sky as well. We've taken to space. And so I'm excited to now be able to talk to you about another important genomics application to the world of publishing. And uh, I thought I'd use this time because we do have such a diverse crowd to try and give you a very broad overview with a lot of content that, uh, a lot of very quick content that goes through some of the main issues of, of how science publishing works and the main <coughs> issues related to genomics that we're grappling with today. So I'll be moving fairly quickly, but there is more information on my slides than I'm able to fit in. So you're able, if you have time, you can look at that and I can make those available to you. Uh, and I hope that's either sort of refreshes some things you slightly knew about how science publishing works or whets your appetite. And I'd be happy to follow up with questions afterward about anything that interests you. So first off, um, I'd like to thank the JGI for putting my affiliation on this name tag. So when I checked in, I found out my affiliation, which is normally uh, Nature. I'm a senior editor at Nature. And as Len said, I'm responsible for all of genetics and genomics manuscripts. And the affiliation here was very wisely called Nature for Genetics and Genomics. So when I first saw this, I was a little confused, and I think some of you may have been as well. Sort of, I saw people look in and asking if I'm still an editor at Nature, which I am. Um, so I wondered if JGI was trying to tell me that they're suggesting that Nature launch a new journal with its title, which could be a good idea. <laughs> and I'll actually be talking more about new launches at the end, so keep thinking if you have any ideas for new launches, keep them in mind. Uh, and then I thought, maybe it's an advocacy group. It really sounds like an advocacy group. Like, and then I really liked it. And then I was very happy with whoever put this on here because it was really inspired me. So the initial title of my talk was The Nature Scientific Publishing. But I realized what I'm really here for, what I'm really doing as an editor at Nature is here to support you. I'm here to be an integral part of a community, work closely with you, and advocate for everything important in our community. To advocate for the best research, to advocate for all the initiatives that we need done, to advocate really for your needs. And so this brought in the nurture. So I'm going to be talking both about the nature of the science and the research publications and also nurture what we're doing as editors and publishers to try and help you. And a, a cornerstone of, of our office is really about service to our community. So I'll start by telling you a little about nature itself and our office, how we work together, the editorial process. I'll talk to you a bit about author services, what, you know, again, this is a cornerstone of our office is providing services to our communities and the evolution of research, that's the nature part of it, how evolution, how the research itself and manuscripts have evolved, and then the nature, how we've adapted to that to try and present the best publications. I'll also talk about the importance of science communication and important initiatives that we are working on for reproducibility of research manuscripts, and data accessibility and descriptions of data sets, which is very important for our community, as well as some, uh, several new initiatives related to peer review, open access, and then finally, several journal launches and a request if you have any ideas for more launches. Uh, so to start off, uh, Nature itself, the journal, was launched in 1869 and it continues as the flagship journal in our office. It is a weekly international journal and it covers a broad scope across all fields of science and technology. The main office is based in London. However, we also have international offices, and the second main office is based in New York City, is where I am based. Nature has a number of sections, and we divide these uh, broadly into what we call front and back half. So starting with back half is primary research manuscripts, so that's what you will write up to uh, summarize your research findings as a manuscript and submit that online. That's what we call back half, that's primary research. And that also includes reviews and perspectives that are geared towards scientists. In addition to that, Nature is a broad journal and we have a front half second that's geared not only to scientists, uh, specialist scientists, broad area scientists, but also to the public. So that will include 
uh, news, commentary, editorials, news and views, book reviews. And each of these sections are managed by independent teams of editors or journalists. Now to give you uh, a peek into the structure and how we work together in the back half, so this again is the back half that handles primary research manuscripts that you'll submit. Uh, we divide the back half research manuscripts into two sections for biological sciences and physical sciences. Uh, and each of these have a team of manuscript editors, and I'm one of them. And each editor will be a PhD scientist that has uh, extensive expertise in the area that they're handling. And, uh, each, uh, and we divide manuscripts by these areas. So I'm over here. I'm one of the 17 editors in the biological sciences team of nature, and I'm responsible for all of genetics and genomics at nature. Now, uh, everyone usually likes to ask me what happens after you prepare your manuscript, you upload all your documents, and you hit submit. So the brief overview is that uh, our statistics is that we receive about in the biological sciences team, so the left half of the last slide, we receive about 120 to 140 uh, full research papers a week, and that's in addition to pre-submission inquiries. So the first decision that I as an editor would make is uh, evaluating that manuscript and deciding whether to send it for formal peer review. And about 20 to 30 of these manuscripts are sent for peer review. Our overall acceptance rate is about 8% of submissive submitted papers, and we publish online and in print about 10 to 12 papers a week. And in terms of how these manuscripts are handled, so when a manuscript is submitted, it is then assigned to one of these manuscript editors in, in the biological sciences team, and it's assigned based on the area of expertise, so if it's a genomics paper, it would be assigned to me. I carefully review this, but I also discuss with several other editors of the team who may have related expertise to discuss it with them. Uh, to handle the peer review process. And in addition to the manuscript editors, our chief biological editor will see and review every manuscript that's uh, published before acceptance. So I'd like to give you um, just a brief snapshot on genomics <laughs> at Nature uh, for a couple reasons, both because we're here celebrating genomics, and I'm, I, I get very emotional and very inspired when I talk about the history of our field. Uh, and, it, and it'll help you to also give a, some perspective on our publication at Nature and how we've evolved with the changing nature of genomics research to really try to continue to present the best research publications. So of course, I feel that I have to start both for our field and for Nature itself as a journal with Watson and Crick. I'm, I'm going to jump right ahead to a major milestone for all of us. And I'm um, looking around, I can see authors on this paper here, so we all know this very well. The Human Genome Project published in a special issue in 2001. Uh, and from there continued uh, over a decade of community-based uh, genomic resources and uh, proceeding through the International Hap Map and the Thousand Genomes Project. And we were very excited this past fall to publish the final phase publication of the Thousand Genomes Projects in a special issue. And we titled this The End of the Beginning because this really did feel like the end of an era. This was over a decade of each of these uh, community genomic resource projects really, really that came together uniting our community towards uh, really important efforts. And each of the projects led from one to another. Many of the same authors were involved from one project to the next. Uh, and so we mark this with a special issue and special publications. And I encourage you, if you haven't seen this online collection here, yet uh, to have a look at it. It's showing how we've moved as a community from one to a thousand genomes and beyond. I mean, we are excited and we call this the end of the beginning and we're excited to where we're going to next. Uh, and in complement with these projects, I of course have to mention the very important resources in our field and the special issues we publish for ENCODE, Mod ENCODE, and the Epigenome Roadmap. So I'm using this both uh, to talk about our field, but I'll be talking about the evolution of publications with using these as a model in a few slides. So I've been talking about the flagship journal in our office where I work at Nature, but uh, we also have a number of other Nature titled journals in our office. The Nature Research Journals is a division uh, 
that publishes of specialist journals that publish research of the highest quality and impact in their specific disciplines. Nature Genetics was the first of these journals and launched in 1992. And as Len said, I've been at Nature Genetics for 12 years and I've worked with many of you while I was there and I've uh, moved to Nature just a year ago. We also have in our office a division of review journals and the first of these was launched in 2000. And across all of these journals, we have a mission statement. And as I've been trying to emphasize, our, our mission is really to serve our community and really to advocate our community and for the best research possible. And I'll, I'll read this aloud. Uh, and you have to remember it, I'll be referring to some of these aspects throughout my talk. First, our mission is to serve scientists through prompt publication of significant advances in any branch of science and to provide a forum for the reporting and discussion <coughs> of news and issues concerning science. Second, to ensure that the results of science are rapidly disseminated to the public throughout the world in a fashion that conveys their significance for knowledge, culture, and daily life. So we do tie this into our daily operations and it's really a way that we seek to provide a service to our community. So uh, um, one very important thing, uh, both for us and we know for you, is a very timely review and publication. We want to facilitate the prompt publication of the most important research findings. So across all of our journals, we ensure that. We have an average uh, response time for pre-submission inquiries of two days across all of our titles. <coughs> For a full research manager that's submitted, a first decision on whether it's sent for review, the average is four days. In the first post-review decision, the average is 20 to 30 days. <coughs> we provide many other services to our authors through the peer review and publication process. Uh, briefly, one of the things that we do is, in terms of publication, is have our press office help communicate the work to a broader audience and, and ensure good press of your manuscript. We also work uh, with science communication efforts and post-publication to encourage commenting, blogging, and in part of the formal publication, include with a manuscript uh, formal corrections, online commenting, and letters to the editor. Uh, something uh, that I think is also a very important service that we offer to all of our authors is transferring within the family, because we do have such a wealth of so many really strong, very good journals that many of you have worked with. We want to make it very easy for you to transfer a manuscript between our journals. Um, and so as many as you do know, uh, when you receive a decision letter from one of our journals, you'll receive a link at the end of that letter that, if it's a rejection letter, that, and says, I'm sorry, but we're not able to consider it at this journal, you'll have a link at the bottom that allows you to click it and pick any other journal on our office to directly channel. Uh, transfer your whole manuscript without having to upload it again. And that also transfers any peer review comments that may have been received so that the receiving editor has all the material and you don't need to go through the process again. Uh, what we've, uh, we've had that for many years, that transfer system. What we've instituted about a year or a half ago is what we call a consultation system. So while each one of our nature journals is editorially independent and we are not able to share any, any of our information or manuscripts, without your permission. Through this consultation, you do give us permission during the submission process to be able to consult. And if you do, then when you submit a manuscript, this is an example here, if you submit a manuscript to me at Nature, and I decide I don't feel it's uh, appropriate to be able to send for review at Nature, however, I do think it would be interest, of interest for my colleagues in Nature Genetics, I can open a direct consultation with them. And then in my letter, I'll provide feedback saying, while I'm not able to review this at Nature, Nature Genetics editors have guaranteed that they will send it to review. You then have a link to transfer your manuscript to Nature Genetics, and they've already guaranteed it to review, and the process can proceed quickly from there. This works also very well after you receive reviews, if we consult at that point, because very often I'll be able to consult with another journal, say Nature Genetics, Nature Microbiology, or Nature Communications, post review, and that journal will offer to publish the manuscript with the reviews that I have. And so you can actually have an offer to publish at one of our other titles very quickly after that without having to go through the process again. So we, we are very excited about this and we hope that you find it helpful and we're always encouraging any <coughs> comments and feedbacks that you have because we continue to refine the process. Um, so I'm going to go now a little bit about the evolution of publications and getting back, I'll get back in a minute about some of the genomics research. 
So as we, as we all know and have witnessed, there's been a rapidly changing nature of genomics research, the growth and the scale of the data sets, many of them provided by the people sitting right here, has been incredible. And uh, in addition, many of you know and are part of large collaborations, the nature of our research has become increasingly collaborative, often involves large international collaborations, which really makes it a different type of research and publication. Um, and because of these changes, there have been changes in the nature of the manuscripts. We will see that the length and the complexity of the manuscripts have rapidly increased as well. Uh, we're receiving often from large consortium many coordinated manuscripts as part of collective projects and have considered how to best present the collective efforts of a project. And we've also seen a number of changes in authorship with increasing lengths of author lists. So again, I'm gonna go back to DNA structure, and this is a beautiful paper for so many reasons, but in this example, it's just so simple, right? It's one page, two authors, one figure. And keep that in mind when I jump ahead, which is why I picked this paper. Um, the Human Genome, the main report of the Human Genome Project, in addition to having a full issue of nature, the, the, this report was 62 pages, 49 figures, 27 tables, and a huge author list. Uh, so obviously that's meant a, a, a lot of changes of how we've had to d adapt in presenting publications. And while we're here, I'm gonna quickly just point out two very important points that came out both in our community and, and science publications for genetics was first that all genome sequence information is required to make publicly available as a condition of submission to the journal. And this was established as part of the Human Genome Project effort by our community that this is gonna be made accessible and journals and editors participated in this process and decided that it's important for the journal to require this as well. And alongside this, Nature was very pleased to adopt the policy of making all genome papers freely accessible uh, in order to complement this. And the way that we've done that has evolved over time. So we've initially made these genome papers freely accessible. And later on, we've adopted the practice of the Creative Commons license for all genome papers. So one more point on the evolution of publications as we go from the first human genome to the thousand genomes. Uh, you'll see there's been a lot of changes in the nature of the print publication with a trend, a really sharp trend of trying to very concisely present the print publication as best we can for a public, uh, a broad public audience in, in a shorter amount of space and a fewer number of pages, most concisely, and moving more and more information to certain online sections that we have, in addition to supplementary sections, which you see continues to grow. Uh, we also have online-only sections that will include the methods, in some cases, authorship lists when they take several pages, and uh, of course, we have an app for that, so you can now read the journals on your iPad or iPhone, and we have interactive website that lets you quickly cross between elements of a paper, that lets you uh, use a lot of other functions, and I've also shown here what are statistics that are shown with the paper, which includes both citation and alt metrics for people who are interested to see how their manuscript does on social media. Uh, so I have said that you know, the changing nature in genomics is that we have a lot of large international collaborative projects and often presenting the work at one time as part of this project means presenting a huge amount of data, a huge amount, massive amounts of results across many publications and trying to figure out how is the best way to really present this story for other scientists in our field, for the broader science and for the public because we want to be here to help facilitate the best publication and message of this work. So a really wonderful example of this came from the ENCODE Integrative Analysis Publications in 2012, which included about 35 main and companion papers across six journal. And while we're here, I'll also note an important quote that the ENCODE authors <coughs> made uh, software public along with the publication to allow analysis of the data set and recreate specific aspects of the paper. And we were very excited about this and we continue to encourage this of all of our authors as a best practice. So uh, this obviously raised challenge. Uh, how do we present this as a publisher? And uh, to do this, uh, we've developed a new publishing model that allows us to go from publication of a single unit, a single manuscript as the unit of publication, to a collection of manuscripts, to a whole body of research, to a whole body of data. How do we decide this whole collection? Uh, and to do this, uh, at Nature, we've developed something that we call threads, that we've called an explorer. 
So I encourage uh, any of you who have not seen this yet, or those who haven't seen it in a while, to go play with this. It's called the Encode Explorer. And um, you can think of this as a way to tell a story across a number of papers. So you have 30-some papers that each tell a very specific story from a specific set of authors. But they're much broader questions or things that maybe are not fitting with a research manuscript, but they're of interest for another field, or they're of interest for the public relations, or they're of interest for a specific question. But they take research from each of the publications. So what we've done, um, you can consider this also as like a highlighter, like if you spread out the 30 papers and you take different colored highlighters and you pick a couple themes, you say you know each theme is one colored highlighter. We're going through for you each of these papers and highlighting the relevant areas and then we'll put each theme together on a page and editorially have some sections that explain what is the story we're trying to say, why is this theme important, how do we link it to, and tell the whole story across uh, a single online page that directly links to each of the research publications that's involved. So this is another way that we found to package the results of a large collaborative project. It's a particularly useful for projects like this that are data rich, and we found that it does help facilitate future data mining and uh, increased reuse of both the manuscripts and the data sets. So uh, this is another Threads project that uh, we've done at Nature, the Epigenome Roadmap Project published last year. And uh, I just wanted to show you quickly how this looks. So on the side here, these are the threads. So these are a list of some of the themes. And these are the research papers. So if you select one of the threads topics, it then will highlight for you, these are the research papers that are included on it. And then you can then go read the thread. And here it'll tell you a little information about what the topic is. And then it'll have a list of sections where it tells you what is the point that we're trying to make in that section. What are, you know, how does this tie together as a whole story? And it'll directly link to an excerpt from that, you know, a particular research paper or several research papers which the entire text, which brings out text, results, display items right on that page for easy access and with direct links to the papers. Uh, this is just one more example of how we've done this for a cancer genomics project. Uh, so I've said authorship lists have grown uh, very rapidly. So from Watson and Crick, uh, I'll use the example of a thousand genome projects. The authorship list was three pages and had to be presented online. This is, uh, you know, this is obviously a, a massive effort and required that authorship list. But uh, given the nature of our research, it's very common for me to have manuscripts today that uh, include a couple hundred authors. So we've had to figure out how to work with this. In this specific case, I've had a production editor uh, rename this paper the Thousand Author Papers. Uh, so that, that happens to me a lot as well. Um, You're, you were on the, yeah. Um, and, and I think because we've, we've continued to refine the policies of authorship, and, and particularly in our field, because the nature of authorship and the length of authorship lists have increased, it's incredibly important to continue to support ways to really define the authorship list, what was your contribution to a paper, and make sure that the contributions of every author is defined in every manuscript. So in refining these policies, we have required that author contribution statements are included with every manuscript at any Nature journal and the editors will check to detail the contributions are, of every author are specified in detail. We also work to support community efforts to continue to facilitate ways to, to give credit to all authors for their contributions and to find new ways to present this. So one way that we have worked with and support is called ArcID. And uh, I'll encourage any of you who have not tried this or registered to go try this. It's very easy and quick to register, and it'll uh, bring up all of your publications and link it to your ORCID account. We do encourage ORCID's use at Nature, and for all of our publications, anyone, any authors with an ORCID, that information will be included in the published manuscript and linked to the metadata. So it directly links to your account, to all your information, and that's an easy way in the future to then link to all of your contributions across the body of research that you've done over your lifetime. So we're very interested in this area and continuing to work with models to help define author contributions and help present the work that you've done over the course of your career. So, um, We've looked at the evolution of research, of manuscripts, and of how we publish them. 
There's also been a lot of changes in how science is communicated, and one of our missions is for the broad dissemination of, good, of the best research in our fields, and we're here to support that. Uh, as we all know, research is not anymore just at meetings. It is not just formal printed publications. It is very important for researchers to have an online presence to talk about their, their work in other contexts. We do encourage the use of blogs by authors and the community. I've, uh, no, I've seen many cases where authors are making really good use of blogs by providing further context of their work, by using it perhaps to provide, provide the scenes example of what happened in their manuscript, how they went to making the papers. Blogs have also been very useful places for uh, much more technical discussions that bring in wider aspects of the community. Uh, and I will say that we do offer commenting and blogs on our own website, which we encourage anyone in our community to use. But we, as most publishers have found, people are, there's much less uptake on commenting on our own website. And the really good science communication often happens on author's own blog's website. So we, we encourage that wherever it happens. We love to see this. And a, a question that we get increasingly is preprints. So what I was talking to you there about is what happens post-publication. So we absolutely believe that what happens at the, the time of publication is not the end. It's just the beginning. It's getting the work out there. Uh, and, and we encourage you to discuss it both after but also before. So we do have a nature long history of supporting preprint servers. Traditionally, this has been very popular in physical sciences, but more recently, it's been more widely adopted in biological science and genomics and bioinformatics in particularly. And we do encourage that at Nature. Uh, we've actually had our own preprint server at Nature, which was closed in 2012, Nature Proceedings, but it's still archived there if you want to take a look. And uh, as I said, we do encourage, I encourage uh, in many times submissions to preprints submission of manuscript to preprints before they submit to the journal. And just for your consideration, some reasons why you might be interested in doing this is that it allows rapid sharing of research information. It facilitates progress in the field. So consider the research findings that you have. How important is it to get it out there quickly? Will it have public health relevance? Will it facilitate other discoveries? If it's important, you may want to get it out right away without waiting for the peer review process. It's also important for your own manuscript. Many of my authors have submitted to preprints and found very valuable feedback by discussing their manuscripts broadly and use that to revise their manuscripts and to you know, correct mistakes, revise their manuscript into a stronger form before they go to their first submission to a journal. I also found that, that authors find that very helpful. It's also very useful to use preprints for some preliminary findings or replication efforts that might not be sufficient for a full manuscript and that you might never write up but are really important for the community to see. Um, so this is a closer look in terms of science communication about the statistics and alt metrics of how you can see that on uh, any of your manuscripts. You can see how well it's done on social media. Uh, so I'm going to move now to talk about uh, what's really been an important initiative for us across nature journals and across much of science publishing is called the Reproducibility Initiative. Uh, first, define what we mean by that. So when we say the Reproducibility in Initiative, we're not talking in this case about fraud, which is also very important, but that's not what we're talking about in this case. The goal of this initiative is to improve the transparency the consistency and the quality of reporting across all of our publications. So one of the reasons why we began this initiative was looking at the extent of formal corrections made across all of the Nature Journal publications. So again, we're not considering here retractions, we're considering here formal corrections. And what's shown here is across the years the percent of all articles that required a formal correction. And while the percent is fairly stable, the numbers have actually gone up in the last few years because uh, we've published, the, the actual full numbers have gone up quite a bit because we published a lot more articles along with new journal launches. So uh, the initiative was started as a way to, as we say here, try harder to correct mistakes and ensure full and proper reporting of all aspects of the methods, the study design, the statistics, and the experiments. 
so I will say that these corrections here will include, that the percentages will include everything from things that don't include, uh, don't affect the actual research findings. So things in my papers are often when I have 300 authors, I'll get corrections about the affiliation of a couple authors that were, need to be corrected, and those are considered corrections. Unfortunately, I don't have statistics to correct for that rate. Um, it is very common in my, in my area. Um, but what we're considering as part of the initiative overall is not that. We're considering things that have to do with actual research finding and specifically <coughs> with how well the, the methods are reported. So an important aspect of this initiative is first and foremost to raise awareness amongst it, in all of our communities, amongst scientists, amongst the authors who are submitting to us. So we do this here through editorials. We do this by discussing it with our communities and the importance of this. And we've implemented this in a number of ways uh, in the course of our daily practices. So in order to improve the transparency, consistency, and quality of reporting, we've, we've implemented this reporting checklist. And this checklist is required for any paper submitted to any of our journals. So you will be queried for this when you submit a paper. Uh, this reporting standards has a lot of questions mostly to do with the, method, the methods, the, the experiments, and the statistics. Uh, along with this, we've also uh, asked all of the editors to ensure that key methodological details are reported, and we carefully check this. Along with that, we've allowed for, uh, we've done away with any length limit for method sections, which we found was very popular. So there's unrestricted length. and. Since we've done that, we found there's up to a 50% increase in methods, and we've certainly found that the detail of this is uh, much improved, and the level of corrections required after publication has gone far, far down. So we also have increased scrutiny of statistics with consultants where needed, and we've provided means to, per to publish source data from figures along with the publication. So this is one example of what you'll see uh, as a result of this checklist implemented. So in a figure legend, you may see now defined, authors will come back after the checklist and have now defined a statement of replication, their sample size, statistics, and provide the raw source data and supplementary information. And, and we're now requiring this for all of our manuscripts. So I'm going to move on now uh, to one of my favorite areas. One of my favorite areas, but very quickly because uh, open data and data access here is, uh, is central to all of us, and I, I don't feel I need to encourage it, but I, I just want to say that genomics has really led the way and has pioneered the way in biological sciences for policies around open access and data access. And so that's something at Nature that I, I use a lot. I use genomics as the example of how to encourage this more broadly. So these are reasons why we share data. Um, we also share data because organizations require it, journals require it, including nature journals. Uh, genomics has been fundamental to us in community resources, um, and we're continuing to evolve uh, in many ways our, the need for genomic data sharing, particularly re relevant to clinical and public health. So I encourage any, everyone to look at the Global Alliance for Genomics and Public Health if you've not. Uh, looked at them or joined them. They have very important uh, new innovative models here. Okay, so we, we do require uh, full data access at the time of submission or publication, depending on the type of data set. Um, we encourage submission to public repositories and where that's not possible for sensitive linked data, controlled access repositories. We also work with you to help develop a data management plan or a data descriptor. We also have policies on computer code, and as I mentioned with ENCODE, encourage the best practice of making this available. So scientific data, and talking about data sets, we've been really excited to be able to launch a new journal that's really based just on data sets. So these are not research publications. This is a, a journal that publishes descriptions of your data set, and it's peer-reviewed, open access, and it's geared to pr promote wider data sharing and reuse. This is, uh, you can look more information on the website, but this is what a data descriptor looks like, and then when you write up and submit a data descriptor, it'll uh, have 
You'll have assistance from in-house curators to present it in a fashion that's meant to be uh, easily understood and accessible for a wide audience. And again, this is, data descriptors are peer reviewed, but they're peer reviewed to help ensure that all the methods and the data are easily accessible and understood for a broad audience. And I really encourage many people here working with important data sets to consider this. Uh, we work regularly with our authors to help them submit to data, scientific data, and we also coordinate that with the research publications at any of our journals. So you can submit to scientific data either uh, before you submit your research paper, during, or after. Um, so, quickly, a couple of new initiatives related to peer review. Um, we've recently trialed, uh, we've recently established um, initiative to look at double-blind peer review. So traditional peer review is single-blind, where the referee's identity is withheld from the author. In double-blind peer review, author's names and affiliation are withheld from the referees as well. And the reason why we've established this is that surveys have shown that this is a very popular request from our authors, with a, uh, particularly amongst younger scientists, with a goal to eliminate personal biases. In 2013, we had a trial of this at two of our journals, and because of the interest and success there, since March of 2015, this has been implemented across all of the Nature titled journals, and this is an option to all of the authors at any of our journals upon the first submission. You just have to opt into this. And, um, this is exciting. This is the first analysis that we've had of this trial, um, of this implementation of double-blind peer review across all the Nature titles. And so this is across Nature, the research journals, and Nature Communications, looking at the percent of submissions and the percent of double-blind manuscripts that were sent to review during the course of 2015. So uh, on average, about 10 to 14 percent of submissions opted in to double-blind peer review. However, interestingly, amongst these authors, only about a third of them properly anonymized their manuscript so that they actually reviewed their author list from the manuscript. Uh, so if an author doesn't do that, we will go back to you and ask you if you'd still like to do that. Uh, what is noticeable that there are, uh, well, first, that this is opted in more in physical sciences journal, which is something that we expect to have higher uptake in physical sciences, and also that lower rates are sent to peer review across all of our titles. However, it's worth noting that this is not related to double blind because the editor does have the full author information and the editor is still making the appropriate decision based on the content of the manuscript of whether to send it to review. We do not yet have uh, information about the acceptance rate, so that we're looking forward to seeing this, uh, but this was just done in 2015, so we still have to wait a while for that. Another initiative is uh, transparent, what we call open peer review at Nature Communications to publish the peer review comments uh, along with the publications, which is very exciting, and you can read more about that on the website. We have a lot of open access uh, publications. Um, we have a, a combination of subscription journals that publish, say, genomes or free access content as selectively. We also have hybrid and fully open access journals as part of our collection. And uh, in the past year, we published, for the first time, the 60%, uh, so over half of our publications were open access. And when we've recently merged with Springer, Springer Nature as a company is now the largest open access company in the world. We have a history of 10 years of open access publications, with the flagship journal being Nature Communications. Um, I will note uh, Nature Communications has an impact factor now above 11 and uh, continues to be very interested in genomics papers. 2015, it published over 20 genomics papers per month and they, they are still keen. And I'm um, sorry, and Nature Communications 2014 became a fully open access journal, so all publications there are now fully open access with CCBY license. Scientific Reports is also fully open access CCBY. Nature Protocols and Protocol Change are an important place to provide your uh, methods and protocols, and Protocol Exchange will also publish only uh, fully open access. So I'm going to get to a couple of the new launches. Nature Microbiology, which I hope is very popular here, launched its first issue in January of this year, uh, now has a couple of very exciting issues up, and is continuing to encourage research in all of our areas. Uh, what we're very excited to launch as a new journal just announced is Nature Ecology Evolution, which provides a very important, uh, much needed, much awaited journal for high impact research in ecology evolution. This journal is open for submissions. 
uh, next month and will be launching in January 2017. I will cover a very broad scope across of all of ecology and evolution. Okay, um, the last thing I will say is uh, another new division of our company. So what I've been talking to you about is a model of nature journals where they're all uh, staffed by professional editors in our office, full-time professional scientists. Nature Partner Journal is within our office as well and it benefits from being part of the nature family. However, it's a different model. The editors are academic, they're external. Um, and they're, um, they do, however, uh, they are run by an executive editor who oversees all of the content and the editors and the whole publications and they're aiming to launch up to 50 journals. And so many of you here will know Magdalena Skipper, who is my predecessor at Nature. And the reason she moved from Nature was to launch this division, and she's now executive editor of this division. And she's very interested to hear from anyone who's interested in any of these journals, and who's interested perhaps in being an editor or launching a new journal. And she's also particularly interested in this crowd for anything in plants. So we're, we're interested, we're all very interested in any plant science journals that we might be able to launch. Uh, so here's her email and you can also tweet her. Um, just two of the journals, NPJ journals that are relevant to us here are genomic medicine and biofilms and microbiomes. That's it.